Look to this day, for it is life, the very life of life. In its brief course lie all the verities and realities of your existence, the blessed of growth, the glory of action, the splendor of beauty. For yesterday is but a dream, and tomorrow is only a vision, but today well-lived makes every yesterday a dream of happiness, and every tomorrow a vision of hope. Look well, therefore, to this day. Come, let us worship. Good morning. Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Church of Berkeley. I'm Karen Elliott. I'm your worship associate 
or as Selena said to me this morning, your wa for today. If this is your first time here, we're so glad you've come. This is a welcoming congregation, and we're always working on how better to care for and welcome each other. Whoever you are, we welcome you in the fullness of who you are. As we begin, we want to acknowledge that this church occupies land in Huchin, the unceded territory of the Chochenyo-speaking Ohlone people. We understand that we continue to benefit from the seizure and occupation of this land. We acknowledge and embrace our responsibility to take restorative action. We affirm that this is deeply felt and commit our congregation to be in right relationship with indigenous communities, aligning in solidarity, supporting indigenous projects, and caring properly for the land. This morning, we'd like to welcome Reverend Dr. Jeannie Foster to our chancel. Reverend Jeannie grew up in New Orleans and lives now in Berkeley. She is Professor Emerita at St. Mary College of California, a former minister of the UU Society in Modesta, and a former worship associate at UUCB. She is a poet. Her poems have appeared in numerous journals, and she has published many books, including a critical work, A Music of Grace, the Sacred in Contemporary American Poetry, which asks the question, is there still sacred ground to stand on? Her new book, Your Form Became My Own, is scheduled for publication in early winter 2023. Reverend Jeannie has received several prestigious grants and is a former poet in residence at Tulane University. Welcome to the chancel, Reverend Jeannie. Now, our Director of Family Ministry and Lifelong Learning, Heaven Walker, would like to make an announcement. Hi, everyone. I just wanted to um, announce really quickly that today we do have one child care associate with us, but not two. So if you would like some support with child care, we are in the front. We have toys. You're welcome to come hang out with us. And if not, that's fine, too. Thanks. Thanks, Evan. Let's prepare our space now with a chalice lighting. Those of you at home can get a candle to join us, if you wish. Let's kindle our chalice flame and the inner flame of our hearts with these words by Albert Schweitzer, as Brian Baker, our director of music, a man of many talents, does the honors. At times, our own light goes out and is rekindled by a spark from another person. Each of us has cause to think with deep gratitude of those who have lighted the flame before us. We also pause to remind ourselves of some of the foundations of resilience. We light with Brian a candle of courage. These candles get harder and harder to light as they get deeper and deeper, you know. <laughs> Somebody here has to, you know, clean them up. A candle of acts of service. A candle of fellowship. And a candle of hope. May we find and cultivate these foundations of resilience in ourselves and in each other. Thank you, Brian. Now, please join us in singing our opening song, We Sing of Golden Mornings. The words will be on screen. Mountains, mountains, mountains. 
standing while we say our covenant. You can sit if you want. Love guides this church. The quest for truth and justice is its common purpose. To give thanks, listen deeply, speak with care, honor our differences, and seek and grant forgiveness. These things we covenant with one another. And now Heather will give the time for all ages. Heaven. <laughs> OK. Happens all the time. <laughs> all right, if you are young of body or young of heart, you are welcome to join me on the stage as we share a story together. moments in life that we have. These past few years, we've had some difficult moments. I think we can all agree there's been some difficult moments. But in those difficult moments, there's also been some beautiful, amazing moments. We just sometimes need to stop and take the time to notice. So this story is called Taking Time. Taking time to listen to a bird's song on the breeze. Taking time to gather up the blossom dancing free. Taking time to snuggle in my dog's sweet velvet fur. That's a good one. Who has a dog? OK. What sound does a dog make? Yeah. Woof! <laughs> exactly. My family is pressuring me to get a dog. I imagine it will happen soon. <laughs> Taking time to feel the beat of my cat's rhythmic purr. Who has a cat? Yeah. How do cats sound? Meow. Meow. <laughs> Taking time to watch with awe a spider build her home. Who's seen a spider? A lot yeah. of times. A lot of times. <laughs> Is anybody afraid of spiders? Yeah. I used to be, but you know what? They make the most amazing webs. They make these artistic webs. And you know that they eat mosquitoes so that the mosquitoes don't get us. So they're actually super important. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Taking time to contemplate the journey as we roam. Taking time to wonder at the vast, astounding sky. Taking time to gaze upon a flock of birds that passes by. Taking time to find myself in eyes that are so kind. Looks like a grandmother in this picture. Who has a grandmother? We all do, right? Who can tell me the name of their grandmother? Grandma? Grandma? Yep. <laughs> I have a grandma walker. 
and a Grandma Gibson. I have a great Grandma Walker. Wonderful. Taking time to marvel at a snowflake soft and fine. We don't get a lot of snow around here. I'm from southern Illinois. There's a lot more snow around there than there is around here. And also South Lake Tahoe. Ah, definitely, definitely been to South Lake Tahoe. Who loves snow? Me too. It's cold though. It's so cold, you're right. It's deliciously cold. <laughs> Taking time to imagine the deep sounds of the sea. Who loves the ocean? Ah, me too. How does it sound? Taking time to cherish you and also cherish me. I love that last line. There's something that we can say to tell people that. Has anyone ever heard the word namaste before? Namaste? Yeah, so what does that mean? Does anybody know what it means? No. No. It means many things, but essentially it means the light in me greets the light in you. So, the light in me greets the light in you. So, namaste. I'm so grateful for each and every one of you. Thank you for joining me. Blessed be. In place of my own reflection today, um, I've invited a member of the Climate Justice Committee uh, which is chaired by Sheila Tarbett, to share a reflection about how her faith manifests. So I'd like to welcome Deb Lloyd. Good morning. I grew up on a farm in Indiana, the oldest of nine children. Our parents taught us many valuable lessons. One was how we could contribute to our family, our Catholic parish, and those less fortunate. We did not have extra money, but we had time to help. Between planting and harvesting seasons, Dad often helped with painting and odd jobs in our parish. Mom volunteered at fundraising events. Sharing the gift of time was a part of our daily lives. When my husband and I decided to explore other faith communities, we found the Unitarian Universalist Church. The second principle, justice, equity, and compassion in human relations, resonated strongly within me. For me, these values require action. They do not manifest through thought only. Intentional participation or action is required. When I retired from my social work career, my goal was to work within a cause that would reflect these values. Unfortunately, there are many choices. Racism, immigration, voting rights, and more are painful examples of injustice. The one that speaks the loudest to me is the climate crisis. Climate change greatly affects the most vulnerable. Here are two examples. Currently, air pollution is the highest in low-income communities, causing cancers, asthma, and other health problems. Extreme heat affects those who work outside and all people who cannot afford to have or pay for air conditioning in their homes. <clears throat> Last summer, we became members of UUCB. I was excited to learn about the Climate Justice Committee and joined it. I also joined a local climate action group and my knowledge grew. The facts are overwhelming. The climate crisis is complex and there is no simple answer. Changes are needed on global, national, and local levels. During one of these meetings, I was introduced to a phone app called Climate Action Now. Through this app, you can take many actions every day. All you do is download the app 
and follow the instructions to sign up. New actions are loaded daily. Emails are already written. Phone scripts are available. Or you can change the wording if you prefer. These messages go to our president, vice president, and Congress, local legislators, governmental agencies, corporations, and so on. To contact them, you simply hit the send button for emails or the phone button for phone calls. It is really easy to do. Additionally, there are informative articles and videos. You earn points for every action taken. A tree is planted when enough points are earned. I have now been using the app daily for 11 months, and I've earned over 150 trees. For more information about this app, see our display at the social justice table, in UUCB's newsletters, or go to the Climate Action Now website. I know every person attending this service is concerned about the climate crisis our global family is facing. Our second UU principle challenges us to manifest our faith by taking action to bring justice, equity, and compassion to our world. As a UUCB congregation, let's make our voices heard and take action. Thank you. Good morning. I'm going to try and get the mic free to move. There we go. Um, I'm going to play, I wanted to introduce the next piece because it's um, an unusual piece. It's by a composer from Egypt, and it's based on, uh, the title of the piece is based on the 7-8 rhythm that's a common use in Egyptian music. It's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And the main theme of the piece has seven notes. Or seven counts. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. However, the music is not written in seven, eight. It's written in five, eight, and the composer uses the symbol that's used in traditional Egyptian music for the five, eight pattern. He uses that in the description of the title. So there's an image up there which reflects the five, eight pattern. The work is in five, eight until the phone rings, and then it switches to two, four. Also interesting, one hand is in one key, and the other hand is in a slightly different key. So this is music that you may not be able to sort of comprehend instantly, but I'm hoping you'll find some, something uh, sort of essential in it, okay? So good luck to us all. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
sounds like or seems like a good time for silence. <laughs> Please join me in a moment uh, in a period of silence, followed by a moment of reflection. Close your eyes or soften your gaze. Open your heart. Now is a safe time. This is a safe place to be tender. During our time of silence, I invite you to hold in your hearts joys and sorrows, cares and concerns, challenges that you or those in your thoughts may be experiencing. Or simply let the silence take you where it takes you. Let us join together in silence. Spirit of life that connects each of us to all. Hold in your wide embrace the joys and sorrows, cares and concerns of each of us. Let us know that we are not alone. Amen. During this uh, time of quiet, I would like to hold in our hearts the people of Ukraine, who we see probably several times a day on TV. I would particularly like to hold the children so wide-eyed who have to grow up among these horrors of war. I would also like to call forth the presence of a man, Czesla Miosh and to read portions of a poem he wrote called On Angels. For those of you who may not know him, although some of you may, since he spent the last part of his life in Berkeley, uh, at UC Berkeley as a professor, Czeslav Miosz ranks among the most respected figures in 20th century Polish literature as well as one of the most respected contemporary poets in the world. He was awarded the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1980. Born in Lithuania in 1911, where his parents moved temporarily to escape the political upheaval in their native Poland, he left Poland as an adult due to the oppressive communist regime that came to power following World War II and lived in the United States from 1960, as I said, a professor at UC Berkeley, until his death in 2004. One commentator writes of his poetry, a witness to the Nazi devastation of Poland and the Soviet takeover of Eastern Europe Miosz deals in his poetry with the central issues of our time, the impact of history upon moral being, the search for ways to survive spiritual ruin in a ruined world. During this time when war, though geographically far away, is near in our minds and hearts, I would like to read one of his poems that speaks in its own way about a kind of grace operating in the universe. The poem's called On Angels. He writes, I believe in you, messengers, there where the world is turned inside out, there in a melody repeated by a bird or in the smell of apples at close of day, 
when the light makes the orchards magic. The voice. I have heard that voice many a time when asleep. And what is strange, I understood more or less an order or an appeal in an unearthly tongue. It said, day draws near another one. Do what you can. Do what you can. Please join us in singing the round. I know this rose, number 396. The sermon, the sermon title today is Grace Notes, and grace notes in music are um, notes which are added to add grace to a simple melody. So uh, something sort of simple and basic can have added notes, and they're often written in music uh, as smaller notes. And these are um, things which were originally improvised most often. So I'm going to play a piece, by, part of a piece by Mozart and I'm gonna play his basic melody for you to hear. I'm gonna put on my glasses to make sure I play the right little melody. That's the simple outline. He does things to move some of the notes rhythmically, add some harmony. Grace notes um, can be uh, sort of little connecting patterns. They can be little swirls of sound. They can be sort of delicate dissonances, all kinds of ways to use grace notes. So this is from a Mozart sonata um, with a whole bunch of ornaments that apparently Mozart himself played.
It's good to be here with you. It's been a long time for me. And it's good to be here with you in a world that seems to have taken a disastrously wrong turn. And I, like so many others, am struggling to re-enter my life fully. So much of the old life has been shut down. One thing shut down for me was the church choir. All the nights of Zoom rehearsal, then the in-person rehearsals, singing in masks in the atrium, all the doors flung open, the cold wind whipping in, the light fading so dim it was hard to see the music. Bit by bit, I withdrew. I shut myself down. How I admire Brian, wherever he may be, and the stalwarts who kept the music going. They deserve a round of applause. So this morning I've titled my talk, Grace Notes. And those first in grace might immediately think of those tiny notes written above the primary notes in a musical score. And uh, I think the slide showed those, although it's hard to see the slide from up here. Uh, the dictionary calls these grace notes ornamental and embellishment. In other words, not necessary or, sent or essential for the real music. Although my focus this morning is not primarily on these musical grace notes, it strikes me that they come into the music as a kind of gift from the composer, a kind of grace. One dictionary definition of grace is a gift, a gift not earned, not merited, not deserved, not worked for, pure gift. In this way, uh, those small musical notes, those small musical grace notes, lead to the primary focus for today. And that's my notes on grace. My notes, reflections on the meaning of grace. Grace, that's not a word generally thought to be part of the Unitarian Universalist vocabulary. It smacks of the grace of God, a heavenly power upon which many of us look askance, often the result of earlier negative experiences with mainstream religion. But I heard the word used about a month ago in an alternative context. And it got me thinking about the meaning of grace again. It was a Zoom poetry reading in which the two, uh, two of the very distinct, distinguished poets uh, were reading from their own work. And following this reading, uh, there was a sort of an open discussion. And in that period, these two poets, and I'm not using their names because I don't want, I, I hope they would be okay with me re referring to them. But anyway, during the open reading discuss, uh, discussion period, these two poets, who are now elderly, were reflecting on their lives, on how they first met as young graduate students, poets studying at the same university. And now, after long years, they found themselves reading together again. One of them said it was grace, really. The organizer of the program didn't even know the two knew one another. But the poet's use of this word, grace, it was grace only. It was grace, really. Sorry, it was grace, really. Uh, the poet's use of the word struck me. It got me thinking again about 
that the meaning of grace, a word I keep coming back to over my years. There are kinds of experiences I can find no better name for than grace. So one experience uh, comes uh, a year or two ago, and I, it's come back up now that I've been sort of struggling over the past two and a half years to find my way in a world that seems to have made a desperately wrong turn. With the pandemic, the self-isolation, health, money rose, climate problems, and that horrendous war. Uh, the other day, in an attempt to do something, to step out of this kind of depression, I was heading toward the ocean on Route 1, north of San Francisco, feeling, so this is what my life is coming down to. No matter how hard I tried not to, feeling, uh, is, this, is this all there is? So feeling this kind of depression, I went around a curve on Route 1 and came upon an entire hillside covered with purple, an entire hillside of purple sage. So I could not not notice it. It shocked my eyes alive. The tears of self-pity, which I'd been threatening, had been threatening to brim over, turned into tears of a kind of gratitude. The hillside was simply beautiful. It was beautiful. And here I was granted the opportunity to witness such color, such beauty. I thought, I'm lucky, lucky to be alive in this time and this place in this moment of now. The purple hillside was a gift. I didn't do anything to deserve it. It was an unmerited gift from the universe, you could call it God, to me. One might call the gift of the purple hillside an expression of grace, the unmerited love of God. Call it the interdependent web of existence toward its creatures. I certainly felt love welling in me for that hill and around the next curve I was given the gift of the ocean. My first step away from the old man was trees, Shug says, to Seely in the color purple, talking about God. She says, the air, then the birds, then other people. But one day when I was sitting quiet and feeling like a motherless child, which I was, it come to me that feeling of being part of everything, not separate at all. I knew that if I cut a tree, my arm would bleed. And I laughed and I cried and I run all around the house. I knew just what it was. In fact, when it happens, you can't miss it. The theologian Matthew Fox writes, in, in this close to quotation, in experiencing ecstasy, we are experiencing what our forefathers in spiritual traditions called grace. Fox lists a variety of what he calls natural ecstasies. The ecstasy of nature, of friendship, of sexuality, of the arts, of sports, of thinking, of traveling, of suffering, of work, of serving, the natural ecstasies. When we get outside ourselves, get outside our own little worlds and connect with the larger world around us, through any of these natural activities, we experience ecstasy, he says, and we experience grace. The action of a supernatural deity is not demanded. Grace is available to us in the everyday world of here and now. What is required is a breakthrough in consciousness. 
in which we break through the insulation of our individual worlds into an awareness of our connections with all things. Our eyes are opened, we wake up, we see what is all around us, the gifts of the surroundings, the purple on the hillside. Well, there's another experience I had really some years ago that uh, caused me to think very much about this word grace. Uh, I'll describe it and see if I can uh, connect it up with the word. The language of breakthrough that Fox used leads me to think of a second experience for which I can find no better word than grace. So after graduating from theological school and before becoming the minister in Modesto, I worked as a mental health treatment specialist on a locked psychiatric ward, dealing primarily with people diagnosed as psychotic at what, what was then called Contra Costa County Hospital in Martinez. What I became aware of is that while we as a therapeutic team could provide a context which improved the odds for a person, a patient, to break through to an acceptance of self-responsibility and the long path upward in the healing process, while we could provide a context that improved the odds of a, first, of a person breaking through, there was something indefinable, something mysterious that actually enabled some patients to break through while others broke down. Something that enabled some to start an upward move after hitting bottom, while others continued to suffer at the bottom. What we did made a difference, but there was still another ingredient. And the breakthrough did not simply depend on the effort of the patient, on how hard the patient worked or struggled. The effort of the patient made a difference, as did the th therapeutic context, but there was still another ingredient. And I came to call that ingredient grace. It was grace that enabled a person to break through rather than to break down. Grace that enabled a turning, a shift from hopelessness to a perspective of hope. And although we could increase the odds and the patient could work hard, ultimately something else came into play, which didn't depend on the patient's efforts or our work. It was a kind of grace. In fact, it often came as a result of letting go. And with the breakthrough came the ability to see the gifts of the surroundings, the grace available in the universe, the natural ecstasies, the love as a power and energy force alive in the universe, its action in everyday life, our own gracedness. Let's come back a moment to those little notes that grace the music, perched above the big notes, like a butterfly lighting on the rose. Not embellishment, not ornamental, but an example of the magnificence residing in the simplest things. Sitting in my back patio, I'm offered by that small, fenced-in world. So many gifts, not merited, not worked for, not earned, not asked for, simply gifts. The hummingbird bathing at the mouth of the fish fountain, and the early morning sunlight in the tops of the trees, my hand, my fingers, the hummingbird's magnificent fanning wings, gifts offered us by our own interdependent web of existence of which we are a part. Such beauty inside the simplest, the insignificant things. I have heard myself ask myself over the recent months, 
years. What am I doing? What, what am I doing? What am I going to do? I answer myself, welcome. Welcome these simple gifts. Make yourself available to receive these simple gifts with grace. Make, your, make it a practice to welcome these simple gifts. The saying goes, someone asked Confucius, this thing called the way, where does it exist? Confucius answered, it is everywhere. It is in the ant. I was in my patio the other morning, looking things over as is my custom. And I was surprised to see in the corner by the fence, a little creature making its way hesitantly, head first, down a thin trunk of the bougainvillea. It was only slightly bigger than my fist. Its little pointed pink nose quivering, black ears alert, eyes like bright black beads. It was an opossum baby. It was, uh, it, it was a possum baby fallen from the mother's pouch. Mother nowhere to be seen. I'd found baby possums before, dead, often riddled by ants. This little possum had made it all the way down to the ground and was snuggling among the skinny arms of the spider plant. I'd already fallen in love with it. I thought, it's probably best to leave it alone, let it fend for itself. But then the, the mental picture of the dead ones reappeared. On Google, it said little ones should be put in a shoebox on, uh, on top of a piece of towel or some fabric and taken to a wildlife center. He was such a living, breathing, scuttling little creature under my gardening gloves as I captured him and put him into the shoebox, still questioning myself as to whether it was the right thing to do. The man at Lindsay Wildlife Center in Walnut Creek was so nice as he transferred him from the shoebox to the animal cage. He called him Little Dude. The little dude was too small to make it on his own, he said. They would make him comfortable and feed him for a couple of weeks, then release him to the wild. The little dude took me out of myself for at least a little while. I think I was a gift to him. I know he was a gift to me. The little dude took me out of myself and at the same time enabled me to be more myself. As I re-enter life fully and hopefully with grace on this thing called the way, the voice said, do what you can. I did what I could. Thank you. Thank you, Reverend Jeannie. At this point in our service, we invite you to make an offering. Our offering gives each of us the opportunity to recommit to making UUCB a strong and vibrant, loving community. For now, we continue to conduct the offering in the sanctuary without passing the plate. Instead, you can either give electronically, see the back of your name tag, or you can use a donation envelope from the back of the pew in front of you, 
A donation box sits in the atrium near the fountain. We support our wonderful good neighbor organizations through our plate offering. Each week, half our plate offering is shared with a good neighbor organization that has been recommended by our Social Justice Council. The good neighbor for July is the Contra Costa Family Justice Center, which serves families affected by domestic violence, sexual assault, child abuse, and human trafficking. Their mission is to bring together our community to support the healing of family violence survivors and to integrate capable partners with a comprehensive service approach to renew our community from the traumas of family violence. Thank you so much for your continued generosity month after month to our good neighbors through this long pandemic. Offerings of any value are always accepted with gratitude. Thank you. And now our offertory from Brian. Please join me in dedicating our offering. We dedicate our offerings and ourselves to the mission of this congregation to create loving community, inspire spiritual growth, and encourage lives of integrity, joy, and service. Now, it's announcements time. First, a quick reminder our website, uucb.org, contains many church resources, and under the tab News, you can find the week ahead, our weekly newsletter. I've pared the announcements down to four. They're all important. First, this is an alert. The Summer Forum next Sunday, August 7th, on voting rights will be virtual only online only, do not come to church at 9.30, okay? But do tune in, it will be worth it, I assure you. The Social Justice Council is hosting a panel of three seasoned phone bankers who will inspire us to get out the vote to voters of color in voter suppression states. Yes, they're wonderful, I know them, I'll be MC for that. So please tune in at 9.30.
There will also be a phone a banking training later on, a week or two later for us. So really, let's get out the vote for those midterms. Second, Dave Wemmer is here to give a special announcement about Freestone. Good morning. Good morning, all. I am the uh, Freestone Committee Chairman. I just wanted to give you a little update of what's happening at Freestone. Last Saturday, we had our first picnic and visit. We had about 25 people attend. It was a gorgeous day. We put the tables out on the deck and enjoyed our lunch out on the deck. Uh, Nori Clark uh, led a wonderful walk around the property. So I wanted to um, encourage everybody to uh, think about coming to our next picnic, which will be this next Saturday the 6th. And we'll have a final picnic a day on two weeks later on the 20th. Um, you can sign up at the table outside. You can also just go to the Freestone page on the U UCB website. And you can uh, click on my name. It opens up an email. You can RSVP to me. If you need a ride, uh, go ahead and l let me know that you need a ride, and we can arrange for that. And also, uh, just let you know that we've been, uh, the committee's been doing some work up there. We've kind of rehabilitated the deck and stained it. Looks really nice. And yesterday, um, uh, we uh, finished painting uh, the dome. So it's, it's looking pretty spiffy, but we still got more work to do. And so we encourage you to come on up, take a look, and um, look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Oh, and by the way, there will be a Zoom link in the week ahead for next week's Summer Forum, which is online only. Okay, number three, if you're new to UUCB, we have purple mugs. So if you'd like to be welcomed at coffee hour, please stay for coffee hour. And if you'd like to be welcomed, take a purple mug. That way we know that you feel like you'd like to chat with us. And finally, on Friday, August 12th, starting at 5 p.m. until noon the next day, there will be a teen camp-in, a fun back-to-school religious education kickoff event for 12 to 17-year-olds. More details coming soon. Okay, those were the announcements. There are more in the week ahead. You should read them. Okay, please join in singing our beautiful hymn, My Life Flows On in Endless Song, led by our valiant song leaders. The words will be on screen. Thank you.
on the great way of our lives. Let us develop a practice of welcome. Welcome to the gifts the universe offers us freely, the magnificence in the simplest things, the little notes that graze the music playing all around and through us, the voice that says in the night, do what you can. Amen.